An interesting solution to this whole business of power dissipation and distortion in class AB linear power amplifiers is to abandon the idea of a linear stage entirely and use instead a switching scheme. So imagine that the push-pull follower transistors are replaced with a pair of transistor switches with one on and the other off at any time so that the output is switched completely to plus 15 volts or to minus 15 volts at any instant. Imagine also that the switches are operated at a high frequency, say at least 10 times the highest audio frequency, and that their relative timing is controlled by a technique that we'll see later in other course, such that the average output voltage is equal to the desired analog output. And finally, we add an LC low pass filter to kill the high switching signal, leaving only the desired low frequency analog output intact. Okay, probably it's hard to imagine all the things that I said, so let's just move directly to the circuit. Alright, so this is class D or switching amplifier. It has the advantage of very high efficiency because the switching transistors are either off meaning that there is no current that is passing through it, or in saturation, meaning that the collector emitter voltage is nearly zero. So the power dissipated in the switching transistors, which is nothing else but the product between the collector emitter voltage and the collector current, is always small. Efficiencies of 90-95% are possible. And because of this, the amplifier does not generate a lot of heat, and does not require a big heatsink like linear class AB amplifiers do, right? There's also no worry about thermal runaway. The downsides are the problems of emission of high frequency noise, switching feed through to the output and the difficulty of achieving excellent linearity. Class D amplifiers are nearly universal in inexpensive audio equipment and they are increasingly finding their way into high-end audio equipment. The input signal is converted into a pulse fifth modulated, which is a rectangular signal using a comparator. This basically means that the input is encoded into the duty cycle of the rectangular pulses. This rectangular signal is amplified, and then a low pass filter will convert the rectangular pulses back to the original analog signal, of course amplified. There are other methods for converting the signal into pulses, such as Delta Sigma modulation, but for this project we will use we will be using PVM. As you can see in this plot that I attached, you can see how we transform a sinusoidal signal, which is the input, into a rectangular signal by comparing it to a triangle signal. At the positive peak of the sine wave, the duty cycle of the rectangular pulse is 100%, whilst at the negative peak it is 0%. The actual frequency of the triangle signal is much higher in, uh, in, on the order of hundreds of kilohertz, so that we can later extract our original signal. Unfortunately, as you might know, a real filter, not an ideal one, does not have a perfect brick wall transition from pass band to stop band, so we want the triangle signal to have a frequency at least 10 times higher than uh, 20 kilohertz, which is the upper human hearing limit, right? As you might know as well, the theory is one aspect and practice is another. If we want to put this circuit into practice, we will stumble upon some problems. The first issue is the rise and fall time of the devices in the power stage. And the second issue is the fact that we are using an NMOS transistor for the high side driver. And what do I mean by this? Because the switching of the MOSFETs is not done instantaneously, but it's more like going up and down a hill the transistors on time will overlap, creating a low impedance connection between the positive and negative power supply rails. This causes a high current pulse to pass through our MOSFETs, which can obviously lead to failure. To prevent this, we need to insert some dead time between the signals that drive the high and low side MOSFETs. One way to achieve this is to use a specialized MOSFET driver from the International Rectifier such as the IR2110S, and uh, the specialized ICs provide the boosted gate voltage needed for the high side NMOS. Don't worry if you don't understand why we use these uh, ICs, the purpose of this course is only to make you familiarized with this class D amplifier, 
and later in the future we will come back to this with more knowledge, looking at the circuit with different eyes. For the filtering stage on the other hand, one of the best ways to do this is to use a Butterworth filter. These type of filters have a very flat response in the passband, and this means that the signal that we want to achieve will not be attenuated too much. Alright, so in order for us to understand how this circuit works in more detail, we need a good set of knowledge about how this operational amplifier works. They were first used in analog computers to perform mathematical operations, and they are essentially a differential amplifier with very high gain. These characteristics can be exploited of course with the help of a few external components to perform the mathematical operations required for an analog computer, namely multiplication, summation and most importantly integration. So basically you can do all sorts of calculations using this operational amplifier and hence its name. It wasn't until they become available as low-cost integrated circuits that it became practical to use them for general purpose applications. In this configuration, without any external components used, this operational amplifier works as a comparator. And the operational amplifier comparator compares, basically, one analog voltage level with another analog voltage level and produces an output signal based on this voltage comparison. So in other words, the operational amplifier voltage comparator compares the magnitudes of two voltage inputs and determines which is the largest of the two. And the output magnitude of the comparator is set by the power supply of the operational amplifier and in this simulator is not present for the ease of understanding but in real world this device has two, has two more pins one for the positive power supply and the other one for a negative power supply. Ok, the other set of knowledge that you need to have is to understand why we use MOSFETs in place of bipolar transistors. Even though the output of the comparator is a digital representation of the input audio signal, it doesn't have the power to drive the load. Which, when we talk about audio amplifiers, the load is nothing else but a speaker, right? So the task of this switching circuit is to provide enough power gain, which is essential for any amplifier. The switching circuit is generally designed by using MOSFETs, and their symbol differs a little bit from the normal bipolar transistors that we were used to, right? But don't worry, because in the next course intended for intermediate people, we will explore plenty of circuits using MOSFETs and operation amplifiers, so that you will have a very good set of knowledge in electronics and you won't be afraid of looking at new circuits while trying to unravel the mystery behind them.